uh, in the series, uh, sharing success campaign, uh, helping students to succeed in the classroom. Um, again, big thanks to everyone on the call, um, both attendees as well as the panelists. Um, and uh, I know for sure that this will be a very uh, useful discussion um, on helping students to succeed in classroom. Our aim is to ensure that you get lots of uh, strategies and things that you can employ in your programs. Um, and we are your hosts. I'm going to go ahead and let George introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Welcome, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, George. And, and George will be fielding questions, um, so he'll be uh, keeping a close eye on the chat panel and uh, responding to those questions. Um, and I'm Kenneth Davis, and I'm your host for this, this journey. <laughs> um, so let's meet our panelists. Um, first up, we have Alicia um, Daigler taylor and Sean McAndrew, uh, and they are the director and assistant directors at Front Range Community College in Colorado. Program opened in 2005, and they have served over uh, 420 students. Um, our next panelist uh, is Deb Bebo, and she is the director at Mount Wachusett Community College. Uh, the program opened in 2006, and they have served over 470 students. And we have Miguel Contreras. He is the assistant director at Riverside City College. The program opened in 2004 and with over 1,200 students served. Our outcome for this webinar is that Gateway to College directors share strategies, practices, and tools to increase or maximize the percentage of students who pass all classes. And so why did we pick the, the panelists? Well, um, after we did some analysis of uh, fall outcomes, um, it was determined that um, the panelists that are here with us today uh, have some of the best outcomes over the last academic year. Um, and starting with Front Range, you can see just a couple of years ago, um, the, the uh, first term outcomes uh, were fairly low. Um, and there were some programmatic um, impacts uh, that surely um, has an impact on the number. Um, but as you can see, they started out at uh, in academic year 2010-2011, 25.4 percent of students receiving a C or better uh, or passing uh, grades in all classes. And uh, that's more than doubled uh, and increasing, you know, uh, academic year 2011-12, and then also uh, taking a jump uh, in the fall of 2012. Mount Wachusett um, has made some leaps as well, um, currently pushing uh, close to 60 percent as of fall 2012. Um, then Riverside City College, um, as you can see, almost doubling their numbers with uh, the fall outcomes being close to 71% uh, of their students receiving C's or better or passing grades in all classes. And so uh, the crux of this call will be uh, for us to answer the question, what did you do? How did you do that? And so our, our panelists are here to share with us some important strategies. So um, we'll start off with our, our team from Front Range. Um, and the first question that I have for you, um, Alicia and Sean, is, what strategies, practices, and tools did you use to improve the percentage of students who pass all classes? So this is Alicia, and I'll answer this question. Sean and I will kind of pass the, the questions back and forth. Um, so a few things that, reflecting on last fall, that um, I would note are we sort of had like a, a culture shift um, in the fall. We changed some staff staffing patterns and divided up some job responsibilities among the staff, which really helped. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit later. But um, for the students, we really shift from sort of a culture that, that allowed them to feel <laughs> entitled in the past, that this was sort of their right and they could come and go as they pleased and that there weren't 
necessarily the, the expectations attached to it. And so we shifted from that sort of entitlement to, to really a, a culture of earning um, your scholarship every semester. And the biggest thing that we put in place that we felt really got students' attention was we have an, a new scholarship agreement. And we had every student and every parent or support person, regardless of their age, come in and meet with the staff and go over this sort of contractor agreement and sign it. Um, and then we also worked with the college to make sure that we could work you know, within college policy and district policy. Um, we uh, disseminated it out to all the district partners, and they agreed to get on board with it so that we could actually enforce it. Um, and so basically what I did was outline sort of what the students agreed to do when they came to Gateway, um, what Gateway agreed to give them or work with them, partner with them in return, and then sort of consequences if they didn't. And this is going to sound harsh, but the major consequence if they didn't follow through with what they were asked to do was that they would repay the college the amount of their tuition. And we had every student and every parent or support person um, agree to it and sign it, um, and with very sort of little resistance, which sort of indicated to us that this was a shift that students were really ready for. I think they were tired of seeing students, you know, get to come back when they didn't necessarily uh, live up to the expectations um, or follow through with interventions. So the one thing I would point out here is that it was not that they had to pass, and it was not that they had to be 100% successful. We broke it down into you have to be here for 15 weeks and make the commitment to be a Gateway to College student for 15 weeks and to try and engage in the interventions and practices that we ask them to engage in. So um, it was really an effort in retention. And for us in our first term, if we can retain students, for the most part we feel we have the resources and tools with the instructors an extra time built in for them to pass their classes. And I think um, ultimately that's, that was sort of our biggest shift. Um, it was sort of an accountability piece. Um, that sounds like a great, a great tool, Alicia. Um, at this point, are you able to discern any impact um, related to the implementation of the uh, scholarship agreement thus far? Well, um, I, don't, I, I guess we haven't assessed it totally because we'll have to continue to look at the data for retention in the spring. Um, right. And then obviously fall to fall persistence, certainly. Um, right, but uh, any early indicators, uh, you know, are signals that uh, students are taking this seriously, that type of thing? Well, they talk about it all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so that's sort of one thing. I mean, I know it's not specifically qualitative, but or quantitative data, but they're it's part of the culture now. Oh well, yeah, no, you no, know, they're encouraging each other. Huge. Right, they're encouraging each other to stay in the program or troubleshoot or communicate more. So we outlined very specific things, and one of them is if you don't communicate for you know two weeks or more, and you sort of disappear because we had a lot of disappearing acts going on that that was an indicator that you could earn yourself a bill. And so they were very aware of what their peers were doing, you know, and, and I, I think one thing we realized is the teenage brain has a really difficult time thinking in chunks of one year, two years, three years until I graduate. Um, and so it gave them some relief to break it down into, we are asking for a 15-week commitment from you, and at the end of mm -hmm. that semester, we'll sit down and reevaluate it again. And that really, <laughs> to them because it didn't feel like the light was so far away. Some of the just the anecdotal input we got from students at the end of the semester was, you know, I, I'm used to being able to uh, come and go when I want in school. And so with this, you know, scholarship agreement put in place, they um, that they feel a stronger <laughs> connection, you know, to the program and, and accountability and that and that I mean when they feel like you know there's a potential for a bill, sometimes getting in their pockets helps, and that's not the goal. The goal is really to help them persist. You know, so that's right. That's right. Um, and you know, um, with regard to discernible impact at this point, I think with any endeavor such as this, um, 
it starts with what the type of culture that is established before anything else can flow from that. And so going back and assessing the culture, I think, was a, was a definitely um, a great move. So um, anything else on this before we move to the next question? Um, I would just point out two other things really quickly. One thing that, that we've noticed, especially going back from 2010 to 2011 when that percentage of the, the, the pass rate was so low, it was like 25%, we had very small cohorts that uh, year. You know, small cohorts like 12 to 15 students. And we thought that would be great. <laughs> and what we realized mm -hmm. was that it wasn't so great um, because of course, you may lose one or two students, but then as students maybe didn't show up or were late one day, you know, typical behaviors that you see in a foundation cohort, it sort of spread. And so we're making a much bigger effort to either team teach larger cohorts if we get up to like 30 and above students or have at least 20 in each cohort because when we went down to between 12 and 15, we, our outcomes were much worse, and it's going to go down again this semester from the, from the spring because um, we had smaller cohorts again. So I know some of that's implement and recruitment and outreach based, but it is an interesting observation. Yeah, it is. Um, it almost seems a bit counterintuitive because um, you would think, hey, smaller learning community, they get more attention, more support. Right. Yeah. That, was, that wasn't the case for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us about the roles and responsibilities of those involved with um, improving academic performance for students, and perhaps it's other folks related to the scholarship agreement or some other things. Um, okay, yeah, this is Sean uh, giving some input on question two. Um, so one of the, um, the things that um, Alicia and I did was we restructured our program in, in uh, Prentice. You're probably you're aware of how that worked, but I'll um, explain it quickly. But we felt like the um, the role of the director um, and the resource specialists and everyone involved in the program was um, pretty big, a pretty big task, and it felt like it took away from um, student the student experience. And so we restructured a little bit and had uh, you know Alicia take on the um, the director's role. So you know, kind of the program-wide role, and then I took on the assistant director role, which focuses on um, outreach, recruiting, those sort of things that the previously the resource specialists were responsible for. And we felt like if we did that, then the resource specialists could be completely student-focused. Um, and so they would, you know, dedicate, you know, basically all their time to working with students and um, students to support people. So. Um, we felt like that was one of the things that had an impact. Um, uh, let me see. You know, obviously their main role, and I don't know if it's the same in all programs, is you know tracking the students, teaching them in the classes, classroom, um, holding them accountable, um, and then looking for um, any sort of intervention that might help the student uh, persist. All right. Thank you, Sean. All right, so let's talk a little bit about making it happen. Um, could you let us know what the costs are that are associated with um, perhaps the restructure, um, the implementation of the new scholarship agreement, or any other costs that we're not um, aware of? And then um, if there's any changes that you're, additional changes that you haven't shared that you're considering uh, making to strategies, practices, or tools. Yeah, so um, the major cost is actually just just happening right now for the restructure because we're actually taking on new partners. So we are hiring a new resource specialist. Um, what we did was we went from three resource specialists to two because our enrollment wasn't that high for, for last fall. Um, so we just needed two cohorts. Um, so that freed Sean up to take on a new, a new role. So that was that's one cost, obviously. Um, and then other than that, we, we increased the amount of what we call PLC meetings. So th that's when each week the resource specialists and the instructors meet for about an hour every week to di discuss students and student interventions. We increased that 
for the instructors. We wanted them more involved in the interventions because when you think about foundation, for us, our instructors were spending majority of the time with students. And so we wanted to get them more involved. So that was one cost. We paid them hourly, um, and we increased the amount of time that they were in those meetings. Um, and then otherwise, it was really the cost to the student if they had um, earned um, their bill in the scholarship agreement. And I'll tell you that in the fall, from, or from the last semester, we're only sending out about three bills. And we had about, uh, what, 85 to 90 students. Wow. So, so people are, students are responding. Yeah, and they're coming. You know, even if they didn't pass all their classes, they're still engaged. They're still talking mm -hmm. to us. And if they don't come back, at the very least, we're having the opportunity to communicate with them and tr transfer them or transition them into another program. So mm -hmm. those are all the costs that were associated. Yeah. And, um, you know, this came up under cost, but I see it as a strategy. But um, this PLC meeting, is that uh, a type of professional learning community? Yeah, sorry. I know it's hard because then there's the PLC for Gateway National. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's okay. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that that's really important, bringing the resource specialists and instructors together uh, to talk about uh, ways to improve outcomes. Um, again, this goes back to this um, idea of wraparound support where the resource specialists and the instructors are on the same page. Right. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so for other programs that might be interested in improving academic performance for its students, what are some recommendations that you might have for another director? Particularly, what would be some uh, good first steps? Um, is this question five? Yeah. So okay. um, advice for other programs, basically. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, it's hard because some people don't, you know, it depends on the resources you have available, but I think certainly looking at um, the amount of work that your resource specialists are taking on is really critical, or it was at least for us. Our resource specialists were doing a million things sort of well, and once we were able to refocus and kind of restructure, um, they understand their roles very clearly um, when students are here and in, in the semester and in session that their number one focus is how do I support these students and how do I communicate with their support system. So I think for us that was really huge. Um, you're taking away a lot of the advising duties from them, um, the outreach and recruitment duties. You know, we would have resource specialists spending time on transcripts and meeting with students that weren't even in our program more hours than they were actually being able to meet with their own students. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think just because of the amount of work that comes and, and there's always those other duties as assigned, that a lot of times the research specialists are the ones that have to take those on. And, and what we saw yeah. was that the student support wasn't there. So I think yeah. if you have, if other, you know, if you're, if you have the, ability to reflect on specific job duties and goals for each role in your program that, that helps clarify and kind of gets the machine working again to really focus on student support. We, we feel like this is going to help in our staff retention and um, you want to re obviously you want to retain your staff as much as you want to retain your students and um, we've got a staff member and a resource specialist now that started out in tutoring, um, taught English and now she's um, a resource specialist in the the benefit of that is she knows, you know, a lot of the instructors on our campus and knows how they test and what assignments they have, and and that mm -hmm. has been invaluable in passing the information along to our students. And I think that's really had an impact on our academics. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in general, I, I, what it sounds like is um, you guys are taking a holistic look at at uh, your program from top to bottom and really looking at roles, and in particular, the role of the resource specialist and um, doing a lot of clarification um, and restructuring of responsibilities for the maximum uh, impact. So, all right, thank you for sharing. We're going to move on and 
hear from uh, Deb at Mount Wachusett Community College. So Deb, um, similar question, what strategies, practices, and tools um, did you use to improve the percentage of students who passed um, all of their classes? Um, you know, we're kind of similar to Front Range, and so I'm not going to hit on, on a lot of the, the things. I just don't want to duplicate what's being said. But I just the points I want to hit on are we also have the same policy where students have to uh, pay if they have to repeat a course, and, it, and if the, the reason why they're repeating the course is just due to the, the lack of skill, or I'm sorry, lack of will versus lack of skill. Um, and that's kind of put some teeth in, into the policy. The, some of the other things, and this is just more for um, you know, sites that are just getting ready to serve students, uh, or if they're looking to kind of add some things to their upcoming semesters, we, we really look at the placement scores. Um, to make sure that the students are, are we use the AccuPlacer, so we want to make sure they're be, being aligned into the uh, correct courses and then the, the correct number of courses. Uh, you know, we don't want to overwhelm them. Um, the other thing is, and you know, we're very big on setting the expectations. Um, in each semester, it's, um, it, it, you know, I hear about like the scholarship contract and I nod my head and I go, yes, you know, I love it, we have the same thing, although I'd like to get a copy of Front Ranges just to see what other things that, you know, that we can add and kind of share that. But um, some things that we, we want to do with setting the expectations, for students that are enrolling in the fall, uh, if they are applying during the summer, um, if they're up for the challenge, we will also put them in a summer dual enrollment course. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it's something that if there's slots available and it's essentially free to our program, mm -hmm. um, we could have a, have a student start making progress towards their high school diploma in their, their college transcript. Um, but it's, you know, again, it's for students that are really up for the challenge. So it's definitely important to set that expectation. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to, to touch on is the within the foundation semester, um, our instructors are gateway instructors. So they are able to, well, let's, let me, you know, paint the picture, the mailboxes for where they receive their correspondence, it's right here in our division. So they're constantly back and forth, either down the hall teaching the classes, or they're here in the main office where they're having daily uh, cross chatter with the resource specialists about any concerns that they've observed in the class. So it's, it's a lot of informal daily conversations, so any type of behaviors that would uh, you know, lead to some, some type of concern, we're able to address it uh, very quickly. Um, the last thing is we have um, mandatory academic labs, and this is in foundation semester and in continuation semesters. And it's really just a, like a, either on a Wednesday or a Friday for an hour and a half. Um, it's a check-in. It's, um, you know, providing resources from the campus in the form of uh, like a guest speaker on financial aid or, you know, how to understand satisfactory academic progress, a, a lot of the, the how-to types of things on campus. Um, but the purpose of the academic lab is uh, it is mandatory for them. So it is, it is part of their schedule. It, it's actually a non-credit course that prints out on their schedule. Um, so they understand that this is uh, a mandatory type of thing. And having that circling back with that check-in has uh, definitely been beneficial for us. All right, yeah, it definitely sounded like there's a lot of parallels between between you and Front Range, um, particularly around the expectations, uh, similar uh, scholarship check-in um, idea. Um, and I think one thing that's maybe underrated a little bit is, the, um, you mentioned that, that the, uh, you're paying close attention to the placement scores. Um, and I've heard from many directors over the years where, you know, a certain percentage of their students have been lost due to misplacement, uh, where students are either in over their head or uh, the skills that they show up with are much more advanced than uh, what the challenge is being presented in the course. And so it's easy to see how those students wouldn't be academically engaged. So. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that little point that could uh, be easily uh, lost. Sure. 
Um, so, uh, Deb, with the approaches that you mentioned, um, share with us a little bit uh, about the roles and responsibilities of those involved with helping to improve academic performance. Um, it's it, it's a, a whole team of, of players. Um, we have several adjunct faculty members that uh, their regular day jobs are they're either um, you know running a trio program on campus um, or they're they're doing uh, other duties within this particular division. Uh, so we're able to offer you know, a couple levels of history, a couple levels of English, and also a couple levels of math with instructors that are, that their offices are here in this division. So with that foundation uh, wraparound support and that continuous um, feedback, um, I, I think one of the biggest roles and responsibilities is that um, you know, the, the faculty, they are communicating with the resource specialists um, and really providing that um, you know ground level type of input as far as how students are doing in the in the classrooms. Um, you know, I think that's about the only part I wanted to touch on there. I know Front Range really um, touched on uh, a lot of different things related to mm -hmm. staffing, and you know, I understand it's it's different at at uh, different campuses. Uh, the resource specialists here. Um, typically do not do a lot of the outreach um, types of activities in the past, but I've hired a new person that came from a TRIO back background and is really connected to the regional uh, community-based organizations and has a lot of connections. So she's just, she's on several uh, boards as well. So she's just kind of doing uh, the informal uh, outreach anyway, but the, the primary role are the you know the academic advising? They are teaching a college for success class. They're also teaching a, a career class. So it's really the advising and the, and the teaching duties that the resource specialists have here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about costs um, associated with uh, some of the approaches that you mentioned, and any changes that you've made or considering uh, to some of the approaches? Um, really, the, there, there wasn't much as far as additional costs, um, you know, with, the, with the exception of paying uh, an adjunct faculty member for, to teach an extra section of U.S. History II uh, and U.S. History I. Uh, it's actually, there's two history adjunct faculty members, and it's a, a father-son duo who are both history majors and uh, uh, a riot, actually. They're, they're great with the, the students, um, so they teach back and forth both um, levels of U.S. history. Um, but that was pretty much the, the only uh, thing. I guess the other thing that I would mention is, you know, our kids that come in in foundation level, if they're testing into um, college level math that, that's above the two levels of math that we're offering, then we'll, we'll place them into that math, so that would be a separate tuition bill generated for that student because they're not in the, the foundation courses that are already contracted. Mm. Um, and then tutoring, that's free through the, the library's tutoring center, so there's no additional fee there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about advice for other Gateway to College programs? Um, well, I would say be willing to try new things. Uh, evaluate how your semester is gone and have that roundtable discussion with uh, the faculty and staff that are uh, close to Gateway and supportive of Gateway um, and you know, have that conversation about what things would you do differently, what things would you, can you try. Um, and that's really how my philosophy on how programs have evolved over time uh, is trying these different things. Um, I would suggest for the um, folks that are setting up schedules, that the tutorial lab or academic lab or whatever piece that you have that that forces the students to circle back and and see their resource specialist and, and check in because sometimes they the students just don't want to do it. We've we've had a lot more success when it's set as the expectation. It's part of the regular schedule. It's it's part of the non-credit. Um, course offerings, um, but they actually receive um, a one credit of high school elective credit for that tutorial piece or the academic lab piece. So 
you know, I would just recommend formalizing um, you know, that type of check-in instead of simply telling your students, okay, here's your, here's your standing appointment time. Um, as you know how that goes sometimes. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, a great speaker once said, students don't do optional. Um, Correct. And so I, I tend to agree with that, and at least that's what I hear regularly from the sites that I support. Um, you know, I'm hearing this interesting theme of um, expectations, and it, it, what, it seems like it was a theme in, in what you shared, too, and as well as what Front Range shared. And so um, I think for those folks out there listening, there really is an opportunity to uh, put some emphasis, it sounds like, um, on expectations uh, with, with students in our programs. All right, so uh, let's uh, hear from Miguel, our third, um, well, our fourth panelist, but from our third college. Um, so welcome, Miguel, and um, I'm wondering if you could share with us what strategies, practices, and tools you've used to improve academic um, performance of students so that they pass all classes. Thanks, Brennan. Um well, definitely everyone else has hit on, on some of the stuff that, that we've been using uh, and continue to try to use um, to, to have, have success during the foundation term. Um, you know, the, the accountability, um, you know, having rigor built into that uh, first term, uh, really clearly communicating. I think that idea of the, the uh, uh, scholarship agreement, I think, is a great idea. And it just really clearly communicates what the expectations are for the student uh, during that first term. Um, so even though we don't use specifically that, that uh, strategy with the, the scholarship agreement, I think we, we've been trying to very clearly communicate what are the expectations for the students during their first term, and how do you get to keep your seat here with, with uh, the program. Um, you know, I think that's really clear with our, our foundation students is the fact that um, you have to earn this, and you have to meet you know, the expectations um, that are set forth for you to, to be able to continue on to, to, to the second tier of our program. The way we have our structure is, is we have a very separate foundation and you know, transition experience to where in the foundation term it's you know, only uh, gateway faculty um, that are working with them uh, and then the second part being the, the reward of getting the chance to, to take you know, college courses and really you know, do what they came here to do, uh, which is get their diplomas by earning college credit. So all that stuff um, is there, and, and we're continuing to try to improve on that. Um, what uh, you know, what else was mentioned too is that what we have is um, the RS role. So that having you know, we went through a change of of restructuring as well uh, to where the resource specialist role was really specialized, and you know, we have. Uh, our, our five resource specialists are, are split. Two are working exclusively with transition students. And we have three that work with the three foundation learning communities. And we've found that that's been helpful um, as we've improved over the years, uh, improved the foundation out, outcomes. I think that's been a big part of it, um, reducing the other duties that they have to uh, you know, take care of, uh, pulling away from that, and really allowing them to give all of their focus to, to their learning community for that first semester. Um, so that really goes a long way. I think um, this recent um, sort of uh, success that we had um, in, in having more students pass the, the foundation courses, um, you know, we felt like we'd built in, um, you know, the expectations, the rigor, the, the, uh, the consistent culture. Uh, we, had that, we felt like we had the right blend of, uh, of people to work. The staffing seemed to be okay. The roles seemed to be okay. Um, but we felt like we had to uh, just kind of reevaluate how we were approaching it. We, we were starting to get the feeling that we weren't quite meeting our students to where they were. Um, and, and we really had to look at what can we do better to support our students meeting, meeting those expectations, meeting that rigor. Um, so that's what we, re we really focused on uh, recently was how can we build, build in better supports um, to help our students meet the expectations that we're setting forth. Um, and and um, on that front, uh, some of the things that we did was, um, 
you know, because of our, of our staff is Gateway staff, uh, we're able to to meet and really plan. So a lot of this was just in the summer, um, getting the chance to coordinate together, plan how we're going to approach this next term. What do we want to do differently? Um, so so out of those meetings and those discussions, you know, we came up with a, a, a couple of strategies. Um, and the first one was a bit more of scaffolding. Our approach um, was to to scaffold the college expectations. Um, to sort of build up to the college behaviors that we really wanted. So um, breaking up our uh, the instructor's um, grading, so weighing the, the grading a little bit differently in the classes to where we gave more more sort of um, more weight you know to, to work and behaviors and, and, and positives that we thought you know towards the end of the, the, the semester rather than just weighing it evenly across we would see a lot of students, dig themselves into some really deep holes grades wise um, because they were still struggling with with just adjusting and, and trying out all these new behaviors and, and, and just coming along in that regard um, so so that that approach helped a lot we didn't see a lot of students with you know a, a 30 percent in the English class and we're halfway through and it's going to be a, a just an uphill battle with every assignment to try to get that student up to a passing grade um, that that was relieved. Um, so so that's something that, that we looked at and we did and we were pleased with. Uh, we didn't feel like we we you know took away from the rigor. We we felt more like we just uh, met the students at a more realistic place at the beginning of the term and then ramped it up uh, as we needed to and, and then absolutely you know stayed with the, the same standards that we that we need and have to determine if they're college ready by the end of that first term. Um, so that was part of it. Um, the other part, uh, you know, that quote, "Prentice, Prentice," uh, you know, students don't do optional. We we definitely believe that. We've seen that, and, and mm -hmm. it seems like we keep building more and more structure into our program as the years go on. Um, and, and for the foundation, it was already pretty structured. Uh, we we've been um, you know utilizing what we call practicums um, here, but um, study labs or, or academic labs um, or whatever other people call them. Um, so we, we just saw a need to increase that. Uh, we saw a lot of students really struggling with being able to manage um, working independently, uh, working at home, or, or some of them just not having great places to, to be able to work and study when they weren't at school. Um, so, so we ramped that up quite a bit. We actually doubled the, the amount of time uh, that we use for practicum um, from three hours a week to six hours a week. Um, so that created a, a obviously more time for them to uh, just have access to our resources here at, at the college, um, but also created more um, contact time with uh, with the resource specialist. So those practicums are are supervised um, by the re by the resource specialist. So um, a lot of just informal uh, interaction during those, uh, you know little chats, little check-ins um, as, as students are sort of just working on, on their their assignments. Um, so that was, um, those are really the, the two major changes that we had mm -hmm. um, recently. Yeah, those are, those are huge and thank you for that. Um, going back to the scaffolded expectations, that one's, that one's tricky, supporting, you know, a number of programs over the years. Um, get into these conversations about you know faculty wanting to protect their domain and um, you know you get into those conversations about you know not dumbing down uh, the curriculum and um, you know doing favors for these gateway to college students and, and making it easier. How, tell me um, how did how were you able to navigate those pieces because surely those are uh, types of uh, hurdles that our, our programs often um, run into with varying degrees of success. Um, I think it's huge, um, and I'm I'm really excited about um, the couple pieces that you shared. And I know that um, that could be uh, an approach that maybe uh, other folks can adapt. And so, are there um, is there an agreement down on paper about what the grading looks like, and, and how did you come to that? Uh, how did you land on the, the, the final uh, product or agreement around scaffolded uh, grading? Yeah, and that I absolutely agree. That's that's 
is very tricky um, working with the with the college faculty. For us, you know, we, we are a little unique in the in the gateway in the network. Uh, being a charter school, our our, uh, our staff and faculty that works with our, our first term students, our foundation students, um, are all directly employed by Gateway to College. So they're not they're not RCC employees or professors. they uh, because we're a charter school. Actually, they have to be credentialed high school teachers. Um, mm -hmm. So that eliminates that barrier. So mm -hmm. really, it's uh, you know they're integrated with the team and it. Um, it, it got rid of that 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 hurdle for us. Is uh, they're they're you know directly employed by Gateway, and it was the strategy that we were using there for the first term because during that first term, our our foundation students are are um, only in classes with with Gateway faculty and staff. Um, mm -hmm. So so you know that that's how we yeah. were able to do it. But I think the yeah. other situation is to where uh, if you have faculty that's working very closely with with your your program, um, obviously it's going to have to be the right faculty that um, sees the, the vision and really sees what you're trying to accomplish with these students, and are going to be you know open-minded enough to to see that that we're supporting their learning. And, and again, we don't want to dumb anything down, but we we just want to meet the students where they are, and uh, and, and ramp them up to where they need to be at the end uh, in a in a realistic mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an example of that grading structure slash policy that you might be able to share? Uh, yeah, I know one thing that our, our math instructor, um, you know, Matt Mortimer did, um, and it's just you know very simple way to approach it is is uh, you know early in the term and, and we split it into the you know into sort of the first four weeks, second second four weeks, and just kind of split the the, the semester that way. Is uh, in, in the beginning, um, rather than rather you know if a student missed an assignment or um, or uh, you know didn't complete something, um, you know rather than than putting the grade as a zero, you know he puts it in as a as a fifty, which is still an F. It's still you know it's still going to show up as an F on the on the on the grade report, um, but it doesn't create those deep holes that we we're seeing. It was just kind of. Mm. You know, we would see these students just dig themselves so so deep in uh, in, the, in the first four weeks or first six weeks, and, and then make a, have a great turnaround. But because of those first few weeks uh, or first couple months, uh, they were in this um, this huge battle to try to get back, you know, into a pattern yeah. when they've actually made a huge turnaround. And we, were, you know, we were seeing that uh, they've come uh, almost full circle, uh, or you know, made the 180, and and just the Behaviors are great, and they were turning everything in, but they were just so dragged down by those early grades. So we just, you know, coordinated. It was the math. We do math. We do an English language arts course, and then we do the guidance courses with our RSs. Um, and, and we we just agreed uh, at which points, you know, we were gonna, um, you know, ramp it up and and right. have you know more accountability and and really right. hold their feet to the fire uh, as we went along the semester. Okay, um, and, and if you have any documents to share, that would be so helpful, I'm sure, for the people that are on the line right now. And then uh, I'm going to go to George for questions in just a second. You mentioned practicums, and just for clarification for the other folks on the line, um, you equate that to an academic lab. We do. Say? We do. Okay. Um, so it's we, basically we an academic lab. Yeah, that, that's what we do. We'll, we'll have uh, we will address. Certain material from time to time there, um, you know, a workshop or, or something like that from time to time. But mostly it's utilized as a, as a study time, check-in time, uh, mm -hmm. group work time for the students. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, George. I'm gonna go to you for a few questions. Okay. Thanks, Francis. We've um, we've had a couple of questions from participants, and so I think just in the interest of time. I will um, I'll ask those and the first one um, is for the folks at Front Range and I think for Deb as well and the question is in your MOU does your MOU talk about the scholarship agreement and and particularly the requirement that uh, students have to um, repay the college. Um, I can go. Ours does not. Our contract does not have that in there. Um, 
And, and the main reason is because the contract legally is supposed to be between the school district and the college and not involve necessarily things that we hold <laughs> students for. And so we use, we have advisory board meetings. We meet two to three times a year with all of those partners. And we use those advisory boards and different communications uh, via email or other writing that um, to, to get that sort of approved, if you will. Yeah, it is also not addressed in our MOU at, at Mount Wachusett. Um, our school district leaves the administration of, of the program in regards to serving the students. Um, you know, they largely leave it in, in Gateway's hands. Um, it has been, the school district is aware of, of the policy uh, through the various meetings that we've had, and it, uh, it, it has not been an issue. Um, you know, it, it boils down to setting the expectations, and when the students start talking with each other about, hey, I have to pay for this class, it, it kind of sends a message among the peer group that they really mean it. This really is a scholarship program. These are regular scholarship guidelines. And you know, the message is getting through that they need to take it seriously. All right. Thank you. One, one question. Oh, go ahead. Back really quick, George. My um, our school districts. I don't know. I'm assuming in other states there's concurrent enrollment, and those are for students that probably are higher performing but can still take college classes while they're in high school and earn college credit. In most of our districts, what I found was if you sort of work with them and exploring their concurrent enrollment policies, there is some sort of um, accountability for pay if they don't pass classes among their concurrent enrollment program. And so we were sort of able to um, get them to understand where we were coming from because we could sort of equate it to their concurrent enrollment policies. So there was already a similar practice. Yeah, it was sort of a different type of student, but but yes. And and to that point, there was another question um, about the demographics for your programs and and uh, the proportion of, of students who are low income students. And I think the I think the um, the idea behind the question is there is what about students who may not have the ability to repay the tuition? I'll I'll jump in on that one. That's yeah. That's the relationship that the resource specialist is building with the student. Um, so they're going to have their finger on or their thumb on that pulse as far as is this going to send a message or is this going to take food off the table? Um, and in, in cases like that where you know it's someone that is income strapped, um, it's one of those. Okay, well here's the choice. Um, you can take a one of our one of the dual enrollment or concurrent enrollment classes through our, our dual enrollment coordinator for thirty dollars, or um, you can, you know, Gateway is going to cover this next class. Uh, however, there's a payment plan, or Gateway is going to cover this next class for you. You have to repeat it. However, here's what you need to do: the grade you need to earn in order to continue the scholarship. I mean, there's no one um, set uh, standard solution for it, but a student with an inability to pay, um, th that is not a showstopper. I mean, we'll definitely work with the student so that they can continue to make progress. Yeah, same here. And the other thing I would add is we try to be proactive with them so that they sort of know that um, <laughs> that might be coming. And one thing that we've done is, let's say a student has to drop out. We just had this happen, actually. He, he left because he got a full-time job. And he left in the middle of the semester, and so he sort of and didn't communicate very well um, with his resource specialist. But so he violated the contract. Well, we finally got him to come in and essentially told him, um, we'll work with you on this. And if you are planning on getting your GED, if you have your GED and can come and improve it to us by the end of the semester, then, then we won't hold you accountable for the repayment. And so it's really helped with communication because obviously we understand that everyone is going to finish here, but it at least allows us to track them and make sure they're in school or getting an education somewhere. Um, so that, that it's also been sort of leveraged to help transition them to somewhere that might work better for them. 
and I'm going to thank you um, for your comments, Alicia and Deb. Um, I just wanted to jump in here and acknowledge that we are a couple of minutes uh, away from the hour. Um, obviously, there are just uh, a couple of more questions left for Miguel, and so, um, you know, if you have to leave right now, we understand, but um, if you can hang on, we'd appreciate that too, and we'll try to wrap up by about seven after the hour. Okay. Um, Jordan, were there, were there any other questions? Uh, no, uh, Prentice, I think we've, we've covered them. Thank you. Okay. So uh, back to you, Miguel. I'm wondering if you could share with us, and you, you ventured uh, here a little bit in your previous responses, um, but share with us some of the roles and responsibilities of those involved with um, helping to improve the academic performance of your students. Uh, sure. Um, we, what we've had um, working with our foundation students have been uh, two ELA instructors that, that, uh, that deliver those courses for us. Uh, again, they're, they're high school credentialed uh, teachers um, that, are, that are employed by Gateway to College or by Riverside Gateway. Um, and, uh, we also have one full-time uh, instructor that delivers uh, the math courses uh, and also a, a, a government economics course that we, we are uh, offering uh, high school level. Um, and then the, the three resource specialists that, that uh, are assigned to each. We, we do three learning communities, so one to each learning community. Um, th those are the, so that's the core of, of who works with uh, the foundation students. Other people um, obviously help out. The whole staff is involved. But those are the, the, the ones doing the heavy lifting and are the, the primary people that our foundation students uh, work with. OK, thanks. And what about costs associated with uh, this approach? Um, I know earlier you mentioned increased um, hours in the practicum. Um, so costs associated with this approach and then any changes that you're, you've made or considering on making? Uh, for us, it, it didn't increase costs uh, to, to, to bring in some of the, the, the strategies. Um, you know, the, the extra time with practicums, uh, is uh, time that, that the resource specialists are, were, are contracted for already. Uh, so it, it's just part of their day. We just, you know, just decided to shift more of our day, uh, time each day to, to having that support in place. Um, you know, so uh, we, we've developed some, some other courses that are available for our students, not so much foundation, but uh, but more of our transition students are students that are getting to the end of foundation and are not quite college ready. Uh, so there's been some costs involved in that, but that, that really impacts, um, you know, the the, the transition students, uh, not so much the foundation. But uh, even that, it's uh, you know, having staff, existing staff, you know, develop a new course for us and and, and deliver it. Um, but but for our full time gateway to college staff, um, it, it's part of the, their daily duties and we're just kind of shifting the, the time that they spend on certain things to, to other priorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any changes that you, you're considering on making to this approach? Um, you know, we're, we're having, uh, we've been struggling with, with placement, uh, college placement um, for, for a while now. Um, so we, we are still consistently, when we, we do the AccuPlacer here, and they take it towards the end of the foundation term, so they don't take it on the way in. Uh, they take it towards the end of the foundation term, um, and they're, we're just struggling with having consistently uh, low placement. Uh, so beginning level English placement, beginning level math placement. Um, so that's where we're, we're shifting a lot of energy and time into um, strategizing for that and, and trying to uh, avoid having our students um, place into those developmental courses. Um, so, so you know, we can improve their, their likelihood to, to actually graduate with us. Um, part of that uh, we've started and are, are definitely uh, putting more, more emphasis into it uh, is a, a workshop series uh, aimed at uh, preparing the students throughout the semester, uh, better prepare them for, for those assessments. Um, so that's something that's changing coming in, coming in uh, soon. Um, as far as uh, improving the, the foundation term, I think we really want to um, 
just do what we're doing better. Um, yeah. uh, we, we've, we've done it for a term here, uh, a couple terms now, and we just want to um, tweak it where we can, but really uh, we, we feel like we have um, some, the right strategies in place. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're delivering them properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like a lot of great things are happening there. Um, what advice do you have for other programs who may be interested in taking a look at ways um, that they can improve their first uh, semester outcomes? Uh, well, the other panelists, you know, uh, touched on it, but I, I really want to reemphasize it is is um, the communication and collaboration. As much as you can have the team that's going to be working with your foundation students, uh, you know, really uh, communicate well. And, and as much as possible, coordinate, uh, you know, mm -hmm. any of the terms. Uh, I think that 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 just goes such a long way. You know, uh, you know, the biggest improvements we've seen here, uh, especially the last few years. You know, we're graduating a lot more students than we used to. Um, it, it just a lot of it is that is uh, we just have gotten to a point to where we have uh, we feel like staffing is is good and we have the right people and we're carved out time for planning and coordinating together. Uh, being on the same page, uh, messaging very consistent uh, expectations and culture, um, and that they, the students really respond to that. Um, uh, you know, as much as you can build in structure and very clear uh, expectations, it, it just it goes a long way with our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting how um, and you three did have an opportunity to. Uh, share notes with one another um, beforehand, but it's a nice symmetry uh, with regard to what you've all shared so from different, slightly different perspectives. They all seem to really touch on uh, taking a look at the roles of, in particular, the resource specialists, uh, but the faculty as well. Um, also uh, clarifying expectations and, and putting some teeth to that. And then also, it seems like there's an element of program culture, too, taking some steps to uh, create the, the program culture that is conducive to student success, which brings us along with it collaboration and, and coordination uh, between the, the staff and faculty. So interesting how a lot of that um, played together. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, in general, any additional information from uh, either of you panelists? Um, perhaps there's something that have come up that we haven't already discussed. Um, I would just like to stress for the the new folks, and this may be more from an administrative piece, but really understand your college's withdrawal policy. Um, because, you know, if your program is not billed until, let's say, a few weeks after the semester starts, you, you have a little bit of leeway to help identify students that might have been uh, or either struggling due to, you know, some type of skills issue. Um, and this is, you know, traditionally more for the comprehensive campus, but it varies by, by institution. But if you can kind of have a handle on that, so that way you're able to either withdraw a student from a class they shouldn't be in prior to your program being billed um, and you know, re-enroll them in a, maybe the appropriate level class. I mean, it's just one of those, I, I think it's important to understand those checks and balances so that you're not keeping students in classes that they really shouldn't be in and then you're getting billed for them. Um, and that's, you know, another thing is like, understand, make sure that the advisors on your campus understand that your students are assigned to resource specialists as advisors um, and that students really have to go through the resource specialist as a normal process in order to withdraw from a class. They can't just go to the advisors in the library and say, I'm done with this class, I want to withdraw. So, you know, there has to be some types of checks and balances in place. So that's just more from an administrative side of the house. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deb. Any other thoughts? Um, Ed, it here at Front Range, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to emphasize is some of the upfront uh, legwork with screening students and t really taking a, a look at their test scores and, and making some hard decisions. It's hard, it, Alicia knows this, it's very hard for me to say <laughs> no to students, but in the long run it does benefit the program and the student to make sure they're appropriate, 
appropriately placed in the program. So. Yeah, I definitely have to agree with Sean on that. Um, we we put a lot of time and energy into our application process. Uh, we spend a ton of time on it and sitting down with each and every student um, and, and meeting with them prior to enrolling them in the, in the program. And uh, yeah, that's one of the biggest things. Uh, with the amount of applications that we get, we really have to make sure that the students coming in, um, not so much even skills, but that's some, somewhat there as well. Uh, but more than that is, is uh, does college fit into their 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 goals and really trying to assess that and, and you know many of our applicants are they get referred over by a counselor or by other uh, service provider um, and they don't realize exactly what they're getting into they're just thinking diploma and if it's really clear that they just want their diploma and they want to move on we, we really try to connect those students to other options um, so that, that that definitely makes a big difference mm -hmm. it's funny that um that seems um, it seems obvious, but it really isn't. Um, but what I hear you saying is making sure students are um, in the right place to begin with, um, and I have to agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, Prentice, all right, Prentice, can I yes. just add one thing to that? It's it's really yeah. important during that intake that the, all the service providers are are understand and, and are connected to other alternative options. So you know when when your kids are researching the Gateway program. Um, that you provide information on these other alternative options so you can kind of discuss what the gateway model is like, what some of the other alternative education models are like as, as far as is there a lot of homework, uh, is all the work done on site, you, you know, what are the expectations. And it's, it's good if you can kind of touch upon those programs during that intake process and so that way you're focused more on trying to help the student find the best fit uh, for them. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, Thanks. and there's a fair bit of work to uh, make sure that those folks at your community-based organizations are up to speed on the type of student that you're looking for in the program. And we know that uh, misunderstandings and, and uh, turnover happens, and thereby impacting uh, you know the the student that you're getting for the program for which it might not be the best fit. So very important. Um, George, uh, we do want to questions. Any questions over there that um, we need to answer before we uh, begin to close out the call? Um, the other, the other question, and we were um, answering it via the chat feature. There was a question about which placement task Deb uses, and uh, Deb, my understanding is that you use just the second place. Okay, oh, that's correct. Just the AccuPlacer, um, it's as part of the intake during the information session um, process. But, you know, if, if someone has a, especially with math, if they have a bad AccuPlacer day or a really good AccuPlacer day just by sheer luck, um, our math instructor will be giving the students a pretest and, and kind of monitoring that early on within that first week to, to see where they're at and to make sure they're in the, the appropriate level math class. But yes, AccuPlacer is the primary. Assessment. Any more questions before we move on? I don't see any more. I guess. Okay. So um, I want to uh, give a gigantic thanks to our panelists. Um, I think they provided extremely, extremely rich information, um, and. <laughs> If you're not getting uh, about 70 percent uh, or more C or better in your first semester, uh, it's a good opportunity to go and take a look at program culture expectations. Uh, you know, what's the resource specialist role? Are they overburdened doing a whole bunch of different things? And so, there's a lot, a lot of information uh, that was brought forth today. So, um, I, I want to thank you, panelists, for your time and expertise. Um, just uh, a few other things before we sign out. Um, this webinar will be posted on the, in the resource exchange on Gateway Live. Uh, I'm going to say by Friday. Uh, your feedback does matter. What we'll do is send out to the participants really a quick four-question survey on Survey Monkey to see how we can improve uh, these offerings. And uh, stay tuned. The plug 
for our, our next uh, our change in September. And it's going to focus on a, attendance, and um, and that will be um, we'll be focusing on that part of the campaign through July and, and August. And we'll also urge uh, directors out there to submit a, a uh, promising practice to the campaign. Uh, you can find a link to the campaign on the front page of uh, Gateway Live. Uh, we're not getting very many uh, 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 subscriptions to the campaign, and so um, if folks are uh, able to uh, provide some some strategies, uh, it's likely that they have a good chance of winning. Uh, very last thing is we'll see you all at the well, most of you at the annual uh, peer learning conference, uh, July 22nd through the 24th in St. Louis. Um, anything else, George, before we sign off? Uh, I don't think so, Francis. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you for your time, and uh, have a great day, and we'll talk soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, everybody.